Testing. Testing. Good, mor good morning. Good morning. Is it working? Good morning. I think we should probably get started. It is about time, right? a hand for finishing this study <laughs> so you can do it again there's lots of celebrating today and I need to welcome everybody online you can give yourself a hand online too okay so can you believe it we're at the end of this study of the people of the promised kingdom divided you did it God did it and this morning, we get to take a minute and reflect on what we just did. Have you ever been through something challenging and when you get through it, you think to yourself, what in the world just happened? What was that all about? That's what we're gonna talk about this morning. And just so you know what you did, you read and studied and answered questions about and discussed and heard teaching on and read notes on 15 books of the Old Testament, which is about, I know, wait for it, it gets better. It's about 250 chapters and a little less than 6,000 verses. <laughs> That's what you did. We covered 26% of the Old Testament and 20% of the entire Bible. Think of all the kings and priests and prophets that you read about this year. Are names like Solomon and Jeroboam and Rehoboam and Manasseh running through your heads right now? How about that showdown at Mount Carmel with Elijah and the prophets of Baal when God burned up the offering even though it was soaking wet and showed everyone who the one true God was? Remember that? And Isaiah Remember blasting through 66 chapters in four weeks? <laughs> but realizing that chapter 53 included details about Jesus 700 years before he was born. We can't forget about wicked Jezebel. And then of course there's Elisha, the prophet who wished he was dead until an angel of the Lord told him to eat something and take a nap, after which he did feel much better. And then there's Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, and Habakkuk, the one who had sincere questions for God. We remember him since it's only been a week that we studied his book, right? And then there's the actual divided kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel where the kings were all, do you remember, good or bad? Bad, remember north is bad. And the southern kingdom of Judah where some of the kings were good because Texas is in the south and Texas is good. You remember that. This study, it was a whirlwind of kings and prophets and places and stories. And the main character throughout all of this was, of course, God. It was God. 
We've just studied a dark time in the history of God's people. We saw lots of failure, didn't we? God's people failed to love God with all of their heart, soul, and minds, and instead, they turned to idols. But God, God faithfully reached out to his people over and over again, even as they kept rejecting him. He purposefully orchestrated events in ways that should have turned his people back to him. He sent prophets who boldly spoke his message to specific people at specific times and persistently called his people to repent of their evil ways, promising restoration if they did. But they didn't. And their sin resulted in destruction and exile for both the northern and the southern kingdoms. Our study didn't really end on a high note. And if we just focused on the sins, the failures of God's people, well, this would be a very disheartening study, wouldn't it? But as I have always told you, every year, the real hero in scripture is always God. God is the one that we're to keep our eyes on, and God is who we will focus on today as we take a quick look back and remember and reflect on our study this year. Now, normally, this is where I would say, open your Bibles and give you an outline of where we're going in our time together. But I'm not gonna do either of those today. Instead, I wanna give you one main truth that we saw all throughout these books we studied. Our study of the kingdom divided revealed a patient, and compassionate God who persistently moved toward his stubborn and rebellious people. God continually held out his hands to an obstinate people who, according to Isaiah, walked in ways not good, pursuing their own imaginations, and who continually provoked God to his very face. If we have learned nothing else, we have certainly seen God's faithfulness to his people despite their unfaithfulness, despite their failure to love, obey, and worship him as he deserved. And so one truth that we can remember for this year is God remains faithful even when we are unfaithful. God is not disappointed. He's not disgusted by unfaithful, rebellious people. He's not quick to write them off or ignore them or reject them, no, God remains faithful, and he actually moves toward rebellious people. That's you and me. He moves toward us with persistent love, and he remains faithful even when we're unfaithful, and that's a beautiful overarching truth that we can take from our study this year. So now, let's go a little deeper and think about or reflect on what we have learned this year as we've studied these rebellious people and our faithful God. And to do that, I have three questions for us. What have we learned about God? What have we learned about humanity? And then finally, we're gonna make it really personal and ask, what have we learned about ourselves? We need to ask these questions because as your notes say this week, studying God's word offers a life-changing experience, not just an academic exercise. So first, What have we learned about God? Well, this year, we clearly saw God's sovereignty, his purposeful control of human history. When we look back over the divided kingdom, we can see that the nation of Israel, that that the nation of Israel's fall, it didn't catch God by surprise. Yes, people failed, but God saw to it that his purposes always prevailed. We can see God's hand, and his provision even in the darkest moments of failure. God's powerful and mysterious sovereignty was on display through every event, every king, and every turn in this story. God rules human history, and not just then, but now. And this absolute control, it settles our hearts about his purposefulness in our lives. God remains in control when things seem out of control. When everything seems bonkers to us, God is still in control. We also learned how a holy and righteous God responds to sin. 
While it might have initially seemed that God was harsh to send his rebellious people into exile, we saw that when God acts in judgment, he is righteously responding to everything that dishonors what he upholds. Who would God be if he ignored evil? I know that even today, it often seems like evil goes unchecked and is even winning in our world. I imagine it felt that way to the people in Israel. But as we've seen in our study, God will judge the sin and wickedness in our world in his perfect time and in his perfect way. And something else we learned about his judgment is that God's judgment is always just and his wrath is always pure and good. His judgment and wrath are not who God is, but are his loving response to the sin and injustices of a sinful world that stands against his holiness. Another thing we've learned about God this year, and I've already said it once, it's that God continually moves toward rebellious people, not away from them, not away from us, Over and over, we saw God take the initiative when it came to his sinful people. He did not and does not let sinful people wander toward judgment without warning them and offering them a way out. God's heart is to call people to himself. And in our study, God was persistent in reaching toward the wayward Israelites. God graciously stepped in when his people made an absolute mess of things. You know, God knows how sinful and needy we are. And yet, as Jeremiah reminded us, his compassions, they never fail. They are new every morning. And God never changes, which means that the God who moved toward rebellious people back then, he still moves toward rebellious people like you and me today. We also saw God's good, but surprising ways. You know, God rarely handles things the way that we would. Who would have imagined that God would use Israel's enemies to purify and preserve them? Or that the exile would accomplish God's purposes? Or that God the Son, Jesus, would come twice, first to suffer and then to reign as king? Who would have imagined that God was pleased and planned all along to lay sin's punishment on his beloved son. Isaiah 55, verse eight, reminds us that God's ways and thoughts are far higher than ours. He specializes in rescuing sinners that that mystify us. And then finally, all throughout the story of Israel's failures, God provided the hope of restoration to come through the Messiah. Did you notice that almost all of God's prophetic warnings not only called for repentance, but also pointed forward to Jesus? God never left his people without hope. The people failed. Their kings faltered. Their kingdoms fell. But God's story moved forward without missing a beat. And the beautiful thing is, is that their hope is our hope because ultimately Jesus Christ came to fulfill everything God had promised. We have learned so much about our great and glorious God this year. I have only just cracked the surface. You all will get to talk about more of that when you get to your groups. But let's also talk about what we learned about humanity, okay? I think the main thing we saw through this study is that humanity still struggles with the same issues that Israel did. Thousands of years later, We, like Israel, we still struggle to trust God. They put their trust in so many other things like flawed kings and political allies and false gods. We put our trust in our bank accounts, our health, our status, our education, even our children's accomplishments. And because we do that, like Israel, we miss the beauty and the blessing of trusting a God who loves us perfectly and remains in complete control. And then along this, with this, we also see our desire to seek security in ourselves and the things of this world instead of the God who created it. We seek human solutions that just cannot match what only God can provide. 
We substitute our inadequate solutions and ideas instead of looking to God to do what only God can do. But God loves us so much that he doesn't let our pitiful attempts to solve our problems and find our solutions work. He allowed the Israelites to come up short over and over again, and because of his incredible love, God sent them into exile. And he also allows us to regularly and repeatedly experience the same spiritual benefit of coming up short. And it is that same love that allows us to come to the very end of ourselves, to find in him what human effort just can't supply. The highest and the best purpose known to mankind is to seek God, to know him, and to walk with him throughout this life right on in to eternity. And then we also saw humanity's utter need for God, for God and his deliverance. We are perpetually needy. We're a needy people, and girls, there is no shame in that because God is inexhaustibly sufficient. So a question that we need to ask ourselves, have we learned from the Israelites' mistakes? Have their failures compelled us to trust God, to seek him, and to be acutely aware of our need for him. And that brings us to our final question for reflection. We cannot leave this study without searching our own hearts. What do I learn about myself? That's what we need to ask next. What do I learn about myself? I don't know about you, but I've learned that I am no different from the Israelites. I know that I am prone to wander from the God I love. I am easily distracted and enticed by the things of this world. And while the Israelites' idolatry is easy to criticize, if I'm being honest, I will admit that my idols are just as real and dangerous as theirs. What do we trust more than God? What makes us angry or sad at even the thought of it being taken away? What causes us to fear? We are so quick to criticize Israel for bowing before gods their own hands have made, and yet you and I do the same thing. Like Israel, you and I are sinners, and we take brokenness, the brokenness of our sin, into every relationship, every marriage, every workplace, every conversation, every scenario we face. Our only hope is to be changed from the inside out, meaning no amount of self-effort can bring about the change of heart that is required. Only Jesus can cleanse and restore what sin has distorted and destroyed. Only he can give us a heart that desires and is able to love and obey him. The gospel The good news about Jesus brings us the newness we need to live for God. Jesus, the promised deliverer, came. He died and he rose again. His death accomplished redemption, the salvation from sin that God promised. We need God to renew our hearts. We need him to lead us to repentance and help us to realize what truly matters in this life. God himself provides the highest purpose for our lives, And nothing this world offers can compare. But even as a believer and follower of Christ, this life is hard. We stumble and we fall. But our God never fails. We can be confident that God will remain faithful even when we are unfaithful. Okay, so what does that mean? What does it look like that God will remain faithful even when we're unfaithful? I mean, we saw it with Israel back then, but like back then, today, life can look like it's absolutely falling apart. I mean, we see our own unfaithfulness. We see all of humanity's unfaithfulness all of the time as we step away from God and do our own thing. And the result, well, marriages fall apart. Churches split. Family members don't talk to each other. There's abuse in all different forms, drug abuse, car accidents, political arguments, so much, right? It can cause us to wonder where God is in all of it. 
But when we know that God is always faithful and sovereign, then we realize that nothing is really falling apart, even though it might seem like it. God is not on vacation, and he's not watching things here on earth and telling us, well, honey, you made your bed, now you get to lie in it. No, he is actively working in the details, and he's moving everything towards his ultimate goals. He is present with us, he sees us, he's working for us even when we are unfaithful even when it looks like we've messed everything up because his faithfulness does not depend on ours. And isn't that good news? How have you seen and experienced God's unswerving faithfulness this year? As you look around our broken world, how does it give you hope and encouragement to remember that God remains sovereign and faithful that sin will not go unpunished, and that he is working his good purposes, even if we can't see it today. It is my prayer that we leave this study this year not just smarter about the Old Testament, but instead that we leave it more in awe of our faithful God. What is God asking you to do with what you've learned this year? Will you brush past it and rush on, or will you pause and ponder and reflect what God has revealed as you move on to the next thing that life sets before you. And so now, before we move on to the next thing this morning, which is the introduction of your new teaching leader, I want to pause, and I want to tell you what an incredible privilege and honor and most of all, joy Even though it doesn't look like there's joy on my face right now, it's all in my heart. It has been such a joy to serve as your teaching leader. You welcomed me seven years ago, and you have loved and you have encouraged me ever since. There just are not words to adequately thank you. And I want to thank my family as well, my husband and my daughter who are here this morning, my sister Alice who's sitting over here there this morning, my son who said goodbye to his BSF class last night as their teaching leader. Thank you for supporting me and loving me. I know it hasn't always been easy, but the real thank you goes to God, right? We know that. He's the one who is the actual leader of this class. He's the one who has enabled everything that has happened here. And as we learn today, he is faithful even when we are not. And I am so excited to see what he will do in this class moving forward. All right, it's time. Let's meet your new teaching leader. Good morning, ladies and Brett. (laughs) Um, I'm Lori Turner, and I've met many of you before. I'm one half of your area personnel team. And so, um, Karen, just segued in so beautifully. I'm here this morning, first of all, to say a huge thank you to Karen, because she has served you and served the Lord, first and foremost, with all her heart, all her soul, and all her mind. She literally... Truly pours herself out for the Lord. And then I'm also here to introduce you to your new teaching leader, Audrey Stair. So, um, Audrey has been serving as a substitute teaching leader in the South Arlington class for five years. And um, I can tell you from what I have seen from her personally and seen from her as a teacher that she lives out the core values of BSF. She truly is uh, dependent on God. How could you do this without it? She is passionate for Jesus Christ and she is very compassionate for us, his wayward people, and I give thanks for that. And she um, lives with humility and integrity and excellence to the best of her ability. We're all broken, but to the best of her ability. So, I'm so happy to tell you that last week she attended teaching leader orientation down in um, BSF headquarters in San Antonio, 
and Holly Roberts, your executive director of BSF, has commissioned her as the new teaching leader for Great Mind Day Women. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, just hang on. <laughs> Not through. I just want to tell you that she, yes, you're going to welcome in Audrey, and there will be some change, but the rest of this amazing staff will still be here. You will continue to hear teaching from Tracy and Susie and Lindsay, and Laura will still be over in the children's area, and Marilyn will still be greeting you as you walk through the doors. And so, but I want to ask something of you before I hand this over to Audrey. I think. Is there a slide with her name on it? It's been oh, up there. It's been up there. Okay, yeah. good. Uh, there it is. Look at that. <laughs> so take note of how to spell her name. Right now, I'm going to ask you to like put it in your phone, right, make a little post-it, because what I'm asking you to do is this summer, will you please pray for her? Put a reminder in your calendar. Put a post-it somewhere in your note. Have an alarm go off in your phone. Doesn't even have to be every day, but just several times throughout the summer. If you would please pray for her. Because this is um, the work of the Lord, and she needs your undergirding, and she uh, will be doing the same for you. So I would ask you to be, and you know, when you start praying for someone by name, it's amazing how God knits your hearts together before you ever even know one another. So I would ask you and encourage you to do that. And so here is Audrey Stair. Good morning, Audrey. everyone. Come over this way, and then you'll be right in the camera. Well, good morning. I, first of all, I just want to say thank you for this welcome. And I just want to let you know, first and foremost, that I am so thankful and truly honored that God has invited me um, into your class. But I have to say, standing up here, I feel like the brand new girl who has just walked into a new school and does not know a soul. So um, like her, um, I'm nervous. This is definitely a little um, overwhelming, but at the same time, I'm super excited um, to really begin meeting um, so many new friends. So just a little bit about myself. Um, my husband is Rusty. Uh, we have been married for almost 23 years, and we have two daughters. My oldest daughter, Megan, is going to be ending her freshman year at Baylor. And my youngest daughter is um, Olivia, and she is finishing her sophomore year in high school. Um, so uh, Lori um, already mentioned that I have been in STL uh, for the past five years, but I have been in BSF for 24 years, which is crazy to me that it's been that long. And I have been a part of the Arlington Day Women class for 22 years. So it is, um, that is a really home. I still live in Arlington and never in a million years would I have expected God to ask me to leave the Arlington class. It was um, certainly a surprise, but he has just made it so clear through a lot of prayer and through his word that this is exactly where he wants me to be. So I do have such a great piece about that. And that really does um, excite me as well. And so this is a surprise for me, yes. And I know it's probably all a surprise for you. But thankfully, God sees um, the big picture. And one thing that I have learned about God is that he loves to move us from what is comfortable uh, to new places where we have to trust and depend upon him like never before. So that is truly where I am right now. And for all of you, I know there is sadness too with Karen leaving. Um, I know this is a bittersweet time because um, you love her and she has poured so much into this class and she has loved you well. So I do know that I have big shoes to fill. So really, we are all on the same road together of trusting God for the new things that he has in store um, for this incredible class. Um, and I just, one thing I want, I'm so looking forward to the study of John next year because he is going to give us that um, opportunity, to, um, just God's giving us that opportunity to go deeper with him. And as um, much as I want to know you, I'm so excited about that and I want you to know me as well. But my biggest desire is that you and me will know Jesus in a deeper way. And we are going to be able to do that next year with the study of John um, Jesus, known as the Word, in John 1, is the revelation of God. 
If you think about it, we wouldn't even be able to comprehend God without Jesus. And so his pursuit of us, um, his pursuit of you and his pursuit of me, he's always gonna keep taking us to deeper layers of understanding and truth um, and trust and love for him. So um, I'm really excited about this study. Um, one thing I want you to remember about next year is that we are not just gonna be studying a book, but all year long we are gonna be seeing a person, and that is the divine son of God. Um, Jesus, who speaks to all of us in such a very personal and tender way. And not only does he speak to us, which is incredible, he um, wants us to recognize his voice. So I'm so excited about that. And just know also, um, again, I'm just going to be praying all summer for this class. Um, and I just am going to be praying that God will just do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. And um, I also just want to... Um, ask all of you to pray for Karen, too, that God will just fill her uh, with just, um, he will just pour out his blessing upon her, and that he will just look upon her with um, such favor, and that um, he will be with her in this new season of life as well. And I, yes, like Lori said, I need your prayers desperately. I don't care how you pray for me. There's so many ways. You, however the Holy Spirit leads you, I would so appreciate your prayers, for sure. So, I think that's everything in here. I'll let you. All right. right. So, ladies, I'm going to close this. Yeah. I'm right here. I'm right. Whoops. <laughs> close this in prayer. And it, I have to tell you, I was going to ask you to specifically pray that God would take Audrey to new places but that, so that she would learn new things about him because You're you would place. be the ones <laughs> that are going to benefit from that. But you know what? He's already done that, hasn't he? And so he's already answering that prayer. But, uh, and I love that you all will be the, benefit, the benefactors of her learning new things about God in this new place. And so uh, let's go to him and pray. Lord Jesus, you are indeed, you are Alpha and Omega. You are beginning and the end. In the end, you are the first and the last. You are Yahweh. You are everything we have ever needed, everything we need today, and everything we will ever need. Would you let that sink into our hearts when we go too far into the future, into the what ifs, or um, too far into the past in the I wish I would have? You are sufficient. So, Lord, I bring you this class. These ladies, their desire to know you better. Um, I give thanks that you have brought them here for that place. And I bring you Karen and Audrey. And Lord, I stand in awe that you can knit all this together purposefully and also intimately with every person in this room. That you are speaking to us. That you are in the process of making us more holy like you, Jesus. And that you, in your, the miracle, the true miracle, is that you would use us to glorify yourselves. So, Lord, for every woman in this room, I ask that as we go forth today, that they would anticipate good things from you. That they would take what they have seen of you this year in people of the promised land. And it would not go into their heads only, but it would go into their hearts and into the deepest parts of their souls. And that they would respond to you with gratitude worship and surrender mm -hmm. and I pray that as Audrey and Karen go forth from here though they know not exactly what lies ahead in the days they know you and you will meet them in those very places and be their Alpha Omega Yahweh beginning and their Savior Jesus Christ we love you Jesus and we pray in your name amen amen, amen. Okay. Okay, it, it's time now to go to your groups and talk about everything that you've learned all year long. And then don't forget, come back here at 11 so you can meet Audrey and so I can hug you. Have a good morning.